Welcome to Lakshmi's Leadership Lounge. And this is a weekly series that we do. Uh, you know, the future of work is changing. And now more than ever, the time we evaluate, the way we lead to prepare ourselves for it, it's really time for us to look into it. This is why we are bringing you a series that showcases leaders who have inspired us by redefining the way they lead. So join me, Lakshmi Prathuri, on this journey as I take deep dive into the lives of those trailblazers and their unique take on leadership. And today's guest is a dear friend and an amazing leader, Lorraine Harriton. Lorraine is the president and CEO of Catalyst, a global nonprofit organization working with some of the world's most powerful CEOs and leading companies to help build workplaces that work for women. I mean, think of that line, workplaces that work for women. Uh, it's an organization with 59 year old legacy and uh, you know, doing a positive change. And Lorraine has been with IBM, with startups, with the Obama administration, and, uh, and uh, she was especially at the Department of State. We'll talk a lot about it as we uh, chat, so I don't want to give a long bio. Uh, and uh, the only thing I want you to remember is that she's somebody who really stands for women's leadership at every possible level, uh, from entrepreneurship to all the way to the senior ones, because she's nurtured many of them in the past. So with that, uh, Lorraine, welcome. And uh, I'm it's so a glad. pleasure to be here. Last time we were together, actually, I was in India. It was... Yes. The middle of February, right before the world changed. So, and yes. I, that was our last opportunity to be with Inc. I know, and now we are uh, with each other through, uh, sorry, I need to turn my notifications off. Now we are together with Inc on uh, um, a Zoom call, you know, on the screen. Last time we were there in person. So, you know, a lot has changed, but still, thank God, we still can connect with each other. Um, so, Lorraine, I'd love for you to start with uh, what you mean by inclusive leadership, which is something you always talk about. It'd be great if you can elaborate on that motto. Um, and what are the ways in which you yourself have personally um, made yourself accountable for being an inclusive person as well all through your career? Um, thank you, Lakshmi. And, um, you know, um, inclusion is creating an environment where people feel like they can bring their whole self to work, where they feel like they belong, where their voice is heard, and therefore they're more engaged, they're more innovative, they have less intent to leave, creating an environment where everyone, no matter what their background is, can really you know, feel like they can participate and feel good about it. Um, so you know, we're at Catalyst, we wanna make workplaces that work for women and work for everyone. So we right. need to create an inclusive environment. It's not enough to just have diverse workplaces to have representation you also need to have inclusion in order to really get the most pr productivity and have people really reach their full potential so we've done a lot of research over the years on what inclusion really means and you may know that corporations are now talking not about di just diversity they're talking about diversity equity and inclusion and inclusion mm -hmm. be a key part of what the culture is about so we recently um, did some really great research on how to be an inclusive leader. Um, mm -hmm. And um, inclusive leadership is important throughout the organization. In fact, 45% of creating an environment of inclusion rests with the first line manager, the person who's managing um, the work. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense, especially in this remote world we're in. It's really right. important to be an inclusive leader and to have empathy and really understand your people. So our model has two aspects of inclusive leadership. One is leading out and the other is leading in. Mm -hmm. And leading in talks about things like being curious, having humility, having the courage to have conversations with people that are authentic. It's really an inner journey that we all are you know, continually on. 
leading mm-hmm. out is focused on being holding people accountable, ha- um, encouraging ownership of the tasks they're in, and as it relates to women and unre- uh, um, and, and minority groups, allyship to support them in that journey. So mm-hmm. you know, being an inclusive leader is a journey for all of us. Um, you know, throughout our lives, whether it's talking to your children or my mother, I'm always trying to be a better inclusive leader by being. Yeah humble and and curious and trying to not to rush to judgment and understand where people are coming from and then having the courage to step up and have those conversations about where you're coming from and really being part of all that. So, you know, we, you know, I'm always trying to hold myself accountable and also trying to um, get good feedback from people um, on, on every day, there's an opportunity every in, in, all, a lot of parts of our lives. Leading yeah. out is also as a as a leader in particular, uh, particular, you know, pe- holding people accountable and 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 giving them the responsibility to to do things and then holding them accountable. That's really important in this flexible and remote environment and where we're going to see things going in the future because we're not micromanaging people on every single task. We've got to have trust. We've got to have ownership. Yeah. We've got to have Adaptability. So, you know, um, you know, I, I think in the inclusive leadership journey is one for everyone to be on. Catalyst happens to also have a tool that measures inclusion on a departmental level. And we've mm-hmm. implemented it internally in Catalyst. We've implemented it at a lot of our companies um, that really give you a read on and feedback on where you are in that inclusion journey. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, can you, can we talk a little bit about uh the extensive research you all do, uh, um, you, you know, especially you were talking about, it's about finding equitable workplaces, et cetera. Um, what have you learned from those? You know, what are some of the fundamental issues uh, that are actually creating gender inequality right now at the workplace? Well, Catalyst has been doing research for many, many years. And over those years, you know, if you go on the Catalyst website, you'll see we have a treasure trove of information. You know, Mm -hmm. currently we're doing research in four areas that are highly relevant to the current environment. So one of the areas is involved in inclusion, leading with equity uh, and inclusion, which we just talked about, but we're putting in intersectionality lens on this because it's not just about gender it's about the intersection of gender race religion ethnicity um, because you need to understand that whole person so we are on a journey to deepen our understanding especially around intersectionality on a global basis and so for example we are um, partnering um, with um, um, with community business and with um, with Tenenbaum to do a, re, a report on religious diversity in India that we will be coming out with in the next couple of months. So that's mm. an example where the religious aspects of diversity are really important in India um, and, and we're diving into that. And we're doing that type of research around the world to get to a more a uh, nuanced level of understanding, you know, the issues of what it takes to really um, being an inclusive leader in the context of the different cultures. So, you know, that's one area we're doing work on. Another area we're doing work on is um, Mark, Men Advocating Real Change. That's about allyship. That's about how do we get, you know, especially, you um, you know, men who have been in the power structure in the United States, it tends to be white males, um, but Mm -hmm. in India, of course, that's not the same, to to understand their unconscious biases um, and become allies for women to lead. So unconscious bias and the cultural norms that have worked for us over centuries that are changing in this rapidly changing world of ours are the things that we need to address and make change Mm -hmm. on. It starts with trying to help the people who are in power, who are invested in the current power structure and the current norms to understand their biases and become champions to make those changes. So that's the second major area. I'm sorry, Lakshmi, do you want to- No, 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 go ahead. ahead. Uh, And the third major area we're doing research is on the future of work. Um, Mm -hmm. And 
that is around you know the the accelerating the and the turbocharged through this pandemic um, change in um, digital transformation, the change in the very nature of work that this big petri dish of remote and flexible has created for us, the changing in norms and values of people, you know, on the next generation, and what that means for um, what the workplace will look like and how we can make sure that it becomes um, um, a place where we have more equity for women and for people in general. Yeah. You know, I was just uh, going to say when you talked about unconscious bias that I think it is something people are get, becoming conscious about, unconscious bias. And it's really interesting, like even popular shows, like I've been seeing Law and Order, SVU, Grey's Anatomy, things that are in America, they're featuring actually episodes where the central characters are questioning uh, their unconscious biases in different ways, you know, like in the medical show, they were talking about, you know, when, when somebody comes, if they're Asian, they may have a very different way of having to be tested or things you need to be aware of than others. And the AI data sets and all that, or the training doesn't include how to be sensitive to different ethnic types. So it's very interesting to see this unconscious bias being played by central characters in shows where they're bringing these things out. And I think it's a lot because organizations like yours have been working at it for years. You know, it's uh, not something that's uh, happening overnight. And uh, talking about doing something for years, you know, you spent over 25 years in leadership roles in Silicon Valley, you know, as a C-suite executive, as a startup CEO, as, as a mentor, as an investor, as a, you know, many, many roles. So, you know, it's kind of hard to summarize uh, decades of experience, but if you were to summarize your experience in Silicon Valley, what are some of the biggest lessons you learned about leadership from Silicon Valley? What would you say? You know, um, I think one of the things that served me well is resiliency, um, mm. you know, especially in Silicon Valley, but for anyone in a career, is to recognize um, that um, you often learn the most from your failures. But if you don't get up and get back on the horse, you will never ride again. You know, if you know, I, I, I am, and we were talking earlier, at probably at, at my view, the peak of my career in terms of impact and influence and and you know I, I love what I'm doing now and I feel that it really is the culmination of so many experiences I've had over the years as you just articulated that I can bring to bear on this. But you know I've had my ups and downs that have moved me in different directions, but I've learned from them and then was prepared when the opportunity came. And that's definitely true in Silicon Valley because we know that you know, um, not every startup is going to be successful. If you aren't resilient, if you don't have grit, you're not going to live um, to to be at that opportunity that's going to be there for you. And as many people say, you know, op you know, uh, success is with when opportunity and preparation meet. And then you've got to seize the opportunity when it is there and and, and really lean into it. So. Um, uh, that's why I'm sitting here in my mid sixties, you know, still yeah. running company organizations and still engaged. Yeah. You know, you one of the things smiling. You froze for a while, but you had a big smile on your face. I know. I'm seem to have some internet problems here, uh, but I just wanted to. Can, can you hear me okay now? Yes, we can. Okay. So, um, you know, the thing I wanted to say, acknowledge, is I have seen uh, Lorraine you in many avatars. You know from being a large company executive to a startup CEO who had success and did not have success and then become a real great mentor for leaders. And the thing I want to acknowledge the most is, um, you know, when Hillary Clinton was contesting, you know, you became one of the largest fundraisers for Hillary Clinton and it was something new for you. You never did that before. And I have seen in front of my eyes how you have, started with you know very little experience in that area and become one of the top people and ended up working in the state department and reinvent your career i've been going from silicon valley to washington dc to be in the state department and uh, um, and then now uh, leading an organization so i think the thing you said that was very very important 
I want to acknowledge is not be afraid of failures. You know, it's sort of, you, you there'll be setbacks, there'll be moving forward, taking risks, all the things that we are always afraid of are the things uh, we need to do. Um, and tying it back to what you're doing now, uh, you know, um, uh, you do a lot of work, you know, especially from those uh, things of uh, women in work, uh, workforce uh, kind of a thing. And I want to focus a little bit on India. I know you talked about it earlier also. So you have a catalyst report suggests only 3.7% of CEOs and managing directors uh, of, you know, NSE listed companies were women in 2019. And it's increased only slightly since 2014. So, um, I mean, this is a problem everywhere, but you're, uh, I wanted to focus a little bit on the India report and say, uh, how can organizations in India build more comprehensive diversity and inclusion practices? Uh, can you tell well, us a little bit about that? The numbers in India are, are lagging, I would say, some of the more progressive places around the world, and that is really unfortunate. Um, I, you know, it, has, it all gets down to cultural norms and unconscious bias and, you know, uh, trying to change culturally. This is why... Overall, I think we're at a really important moment in time. As I was saying, the very nature of work is really changing because of this big experiment on flexible and remote, because of the, the, the technological changes that are happening. Um, it is an opportunity for us to really look at the future. So, you know, I, the, the, the structural issues exist all around the world to some more or less extent. Um, the pyramid of more women at the entry level and much less at the top exists every place. The, the work to get more women higher up in the hierarchy has to do with doing the hard work that Catalyst has been focused on around changing culture, around com getting commitment at the top of the organization, um, around putting policies and practices together that support things like child care, parental leave, um, being able to work flexibly and remotely. Um, in India, even safety precautions so that people can get to work and, and, and feel comfortable and have be psychologically safe as well. These all need to be worked on with intentionality. Now, you know, um, I, you know, there are companies in India that are very focused on that. One of our award winners, Schneider Electric in India, won the Catalyst Award. They've done incredible stuff around this. But, you know, that you know, there needs to be much more commitment at the top of the organization and understanding that in the 21st century, if we want to have access to the best talent, if we want to make them most productive, if we uh, want to attract that talent, that we, and we need to lean into this. And in fact, all the research shows that more diverse teams get better results or more innovative. So companies who are going to lean into this are going to be more successful in the long run. And, you know, that's what's happening actually in the United States. And with my supporters, they are, most of them are in Europe or North America. We don't have that many headquartered in India, but many of them have Indian um, subs with lots and lots of people. In fact, I just did a big thing for Genpak. Now Genpak, I think technically is headquartered in New York, but I think most of their employees work in India. And we talked about all this and the CEO of Genpak is very, very committed to make this their differentiator in attracting and retaining talent and, and being successful. So I, I think we have some good models and good role models. We need to highlight them, celebrate them and let them set the tone and, and, and lead the change. Uh, I agree. And I'm glad, uh, you know, Genpak is an amazing company, you know, uh, Promote Bazin, who started it here, and Tiger. They're all very, very good friends of Inc. And uh, they've done great work. So I'm glad you're working with them. Um, so one He's thing on my board. I just did an event. They did a worldwide event, and I was one of the speakers. That was on Thursday. Uh, and Tiger oh, wow. is amazing. He, he is like a – you should definitely have him on this because he's a real champion yes. Absolutely, absolutely. We had him speak before. He's really an amazing uh, person. Um, so one thing I want to ask uh, you before we uh, talk about other things is what lessons 
uh, you talked briefly about this also, but what lessons can failure teach us to pursue success? Um, and what is a, you know, your one ex your personal one experience uh, that sort of uh, guides you uh, not to be afraid of failure? Well, you know, first of all, you know, failure has when, when you really, really learn and try to focus on what I think is really critical to um, a successful career. What are you passionate about? What do you do well? And what do you really like to spend your time doing and getting them aligned? And, you know, I'll give you a, a personal example. You know, I did two startups in Silicon Valley. And the second one was not successful. You know, I actually lost my job, you know, and I was really in a funk after that, you know, and I had to really re-examine, you know, whether I even wanted to be in the startup environment, whether that was really a, a good aligned for me. And, you know, the voice in Silicon Valley that took me from being in a large companies into the startup world around the time of the internet bubble was not my internal voice. It was the external voice of what was cool, what was hot, what was the thing you should be doing in Silicon Valley. Um, but after that experience, you know, I was able to align my passion around women's leadership Mm -hmm. which I decided to focus on Hillary Clinton and helping, you know, get her pre become president of the United States and then take my, my natural good skills around fundraising and sales, basically sales, which I had done all my life very successfully and then apply it into this new area. So you started the conversation by saying, I knew nothing about the political environment, but the mm -hmm. fact is the skills were transferable and they were what I really enjoyed. So I was able to use my networking and my, uh, my sales skills and I applied it to this whole other area that I had real passion about. And, you know, that really changed my entire life. It expanded my network and put me on this path that I didn't know I'd end up going to work at the State Department at the time, but I focused on something that I had passion about, that I was really engaged in, that I could really be my best whole self and it put me on another path yeah and that's the thing I learned from you at that time is you start something apply your skill set to a completely different area without expecting anything out of it and then when you do well amazing things uh, will follow I mean when you started fundraising I remember none of us knew you were going to go work for the state department and you know I didn't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> right <laughs> So now we are on to a segment, uh, Lauren, where you get to ask me questions. We call this Stump Me If You Can uh, questions. So go ahead. Well, it's, you well, actually, uh, okay. people uh, don't really know that you and you in 2007, um, uh, we asked you and we were recommended, and this is part of who stump you who recommended you to help lead a trip that we had a CEO women's group and we wanted to do some type of travel together and a friend of mine recommended you to lead that trip and it was your first foray I believe into thinking about what you would want to maybe do in India so why don't you tell me how you got connected and then what was the most uh, um impactful, memorable thing from that trip. Yeah. So I'll tell you that actually there are two women who connected us. The first was, uh, one is Vani Kola, my childhood uh, friend who uh, was part of the women's leadership group. And she said, you know, Lakshmi, you are thinking of moving to India and stuff. So why don't you do this? As This was our first project we took professionally in our company. And second was Ellen Konar, my friend from... Uh, Intel, who arranged a dinner for us. We had dinner in on California Avenue. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I remember those two things very, very well about you, Lorraine, meeting you. And you were leading that team, that group from um, uh, to the, the group of CEOs to go to India. So you were like sort of the person who was pulling it all together. And uh, uh, and that was the first time I did anything in India. And I was uh, I wanted to test do I know how to show India to people in a way that I want to show it? Because, you know, part of the reason why I started the company was my frustration that people saw India very narrowly, you know, it's sort of, okay, it's outsourcing, especially at that time, you know, 
cheap cost arbitrage or something like that, but they never saw it in its entirety. So I felt it would be great to have this group of women uh, to go with me. And now the second question was a little bit about the experience. And I mean, just to say now, 14 years later, I am doing what I started. So obviously that trip, trip was uh, very, very pivotal in me deciding uh, doing this. And I have to say that the thing that's most memorable for me from the trip was that now, you know, for those of you are listening, you got to remember, these are all absolutely type A women from Silicon Valley, which is the aggressive of the aggressive, you know, that nobody minces words. Just as an example, I threw a dinner for all of them in an Indian restaurant to begin with. And Virginia, who's a dear friend now, she walks and says, I hate Indian food. I mean, this is sort of how the evening starts. I'm like, oh my God, I hope this trip is going to be okay. <laughs> and fast forward to the end, everybody was sharing rooms. I mean, these women were doing things they haven't you know, they're all like at the top of their game. And we were like, no, we need to do this. We need to be together. We need to share rooms. We were like in a, you know, experimenting uh, mode. And everyone, I mean, uh, I, you know, was so wonderful. And, and toward the end of the group, again, remember, this is a very business focused, strong women CEO group. Toward the end of it, we were all in Jaipur. Um, one evening we got together and Wendy, who's one of the, women who was there, she read a poem. Uh, and uh, you know, it was like the way we bonded in 2007, that evening, it was like we were sisters from various misters, you know? I mean, it was just such a tight group uh, that formed. So uh, even today in 2021, we all meet at least two, three times a year and have dinner together. And that sisterhood, of the trip um, last year today, that gave me the confidence that I know how to present India to the rest of the world in a way that is different. And it gave me the courage to actually take a professional leap into it. So uh, it, I just want to acknowledge uh, Lorraine that I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing, but for that trip, that was a very, very pivotal trip. Well, that is so heartwarming to me. And I have to say, you know, some really, really deep friendships came out of that. Yes. And Lakshmi did India in a way that was is so memorable from every aspect, the cultural, the artistic, the business, the micro. We saw everything on she, yeah. you know, the political side of things. So you know, we really got to understand India, India and actually Lakshmi and I and another woman, we then did a, went around Rajasthan and had another adventure there. Yeah. So that was also fun as well. So <laughs> it is one of my memories of her a lifetime. So I have one other question to ask you, Lakshmi. Um, mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about inclusive leadership and you've been in Silicon Valley and you've been in India. You know, what does that you know, inclusion, I don't mean to like take a, a, just a broad-based cultural thing because it can be very individual, but what are the differences? What do you see the differences between the two cultures? Um, I'm Actually, I think I'll put this in what you talked about, which is leading in and leading out, you know. Um, I mean, and this is a personal experience. This doesn't mean that's what the culture is. Um, I came to America when I was very young uh, in a very formative age when I was just beginning my career. So America actually taught me about leading in, uh, you know, to have very open conversations about what is my purpose? What is my, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? I wasn't judged because uh, I, I wasn't good at something. It was okay. If you didn't know it, learn something else, you know, to really form my own inner personality of what does leadership mean for me, especially working with people like Andy Grove and Gordon Moore and you know people like that, really taught me that leading in, you know, what, what are your core values? And India for me, from the time I was a kid, it was always about leading out. Uh, you know, India is a country where, uh, and we have experienced this when we all went, it's like there are no boundaries. People are with you, they invite you home, they, hug you they just start all they ask you all kinds of personal questions like 
you know, what is your salary? How many kids do you have? And, you know, why are they not married? Why are you not married? I mean, like all sorts of things, you know, it's, but it's such an exuberant culture. And it's in India, I really learned that leading out. And I think U.S. taught me where the boundaries are for that leading out. Whereas, uh, you know, in India, I learned how to stop sometimes and take my private space also and not just be always out there. So I think each culture has taught me very, very different things. I mean, my ability to embrace any uh, any person, any culture, any idea definitely comes from India. And my ability to stop and question myself and be okay with my shortcomings or be okay with being, you know, vociferous, et cetera, comes from my time in America. So I think uh, those are the two things that I really value my combination of the two cultures. I couldn't I couldn't have had a better combination right and you're the so, best ambassador for that yeah so we are at the end of our uh, time so Lorraine I just want to say that you know one of the things we talk about is uh, ink tree seed what can we do together first of all we both are focused on uh, you know how to build great leadership we work a lot with startups and you know starting up and you work a lot with established organizations and i really hope we can work together where we can take some of your research and learnings and we can pass it on to a lot of the uh, millennials and startups etc and i really look forward to working with you to see how we can you know create a larger uh, you know footprint for uh, stuff you're already doing in the public domain. Uh, you know, we would oh. love to work with you on that uh, and how to make you and your organization be better known to our young, um, you know, entrepreneurs and, uh, you, you know, people. That'd be really an amazing thing for us to think about in the future. Uh, I and, look forward uh, to exploring that and having more impact on a broader or yeah, just more people know about what you're talking about is ex is that itself is a huge, huge, uh, uh, you know, help you can give us on how to make people more aware of their unconscious biases and inclusion. And it's not just a check, a check mark, you know, uh, it's a real integral part of a company from the time you start a company. So there is a lot we can learn from you and uh, create that bridge. So well, I really want to thank anyone you. can go on our website at catalyst.org and look yes. at a lot of this research. And if you really want to go in depth, you can become a catalyst supporter. So you know just reach out if there's interest in going more deeply. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you so much for your time, Lorraine. And uh, here is to all of you who are listening. Uh, there's a great uh, you, you know thing we can learn from Lorraine about reinventing yourself. I mean, she talked about how being in the mid 60s, she's leading a new organization. And, uh, and I know that she'll just keep going. There's no stopping. Uh, I, I think age is just a number. Uh, it's really the state of mind. And we need to keep reinventing ourselves. And I love the leading in and leading out uh, kind of a thing. I think as a leader, it's important to balance both. Uh, to have that inner journey as well as the outward uh, presentation. So thank you so much for your time, Lorraine, and we'll see all of you next Monday, 9 p.m. Indian Standard Time again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.